go ahead and open up to Ephesians. I'm going to force myself to leave Romans. I'll probably say Romans over and over again, and if, you, if I do, you know it's probably I mean Ephesians. So go to Ephesians. Uh, and last week, we kind of closed out Romans looking at this idea of the mystery, the gospel slash mystery. Uh, and now Paul is going to take that mystery concept and he's uh, going to develop it in a way he didn't do in the book of Romans. So let's just look. Remember we ended Romans 16.25. We don't have to turn there. Hopefully everyone here has it by heart. Uh, what establishes us today is Paul's gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Uh, and I suggested that it's but now is manifested uh, through Paul's prophetic scriptures. So with that in mind, uh, we can't just leave that behind. Now that leads us into Ephesians. So go to Ephesians, and I just want to look uh, at Ephesians and how he's going to pick up this idea of the gospel slash uh, mystery. So we're, let's just look at a couple verses here, kind of skip our stone, skip a stone through Ephesians, uh, just to uh, say we, we touch bases in Ephesians. Uh, and let's look at, oh, let's begin at verse, chapter 1, verse 8 wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. Now, as soon as you hear that wisdom word, what, see, this is where people say, go on to Ephesians, and I can't really, because in order for that to really be important to you, you have to remember what he told you about the wisdom of God in Ephesians. I mean, see, now I'm mixing up all the names. In Romans, in Romans 11, oh, I think it's verse 33 or so, he, after describing the mystery in all its fullness there, he says, that's the wisdom of God. So when you hear wisdom, he's talking about the mystery. And I can prove that because we're going to read the next verse here. Look at verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded us all wisdom. You hear wisdom? God's wisdom for today is the mystery. Uh, and I have proof and prudence, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, there's a key word there, that purposed word. Uh, if in Romans he sets out, I kind of put it this way, in Romans he sets out the mechanics of the revelation of the mystery, the, how the mystery worked. This is what the mystery is mechanically in Romans. G God raised up the Apostle Paul to take his good news out to the world apart from Israel and through her fall. That's the mechanics of the mystery. When you see Paul going out to the Gentiles, or the world, especially the Gentiles, apart from national Israel, restored national Israel, and is giving them spiritual blessings, that's the mystery. That was never revealed before. It was something kept secret. Now in Ephesians, he's going to tell us why he came up with that new program, what the ultimate purpose of that program was. And we'll see that as we go through. Look over at chapter 3. We have verification of this. Go to chapter 3, verse 1. We'll pick it up here because we have to know who he's talking with here. Uh, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. So he's uh, a prisoner of Jesus Christ here. That's who he's referring to. For you Gentiles, uh, apart from Israel and through her fall. That's the mystery. If it was with Israel through her rise, that would be the prophetic program. Paul's sent, being sent out according, in a way that had never been spoken about before, and I'll prove it. You know how I'm going to prove it? Just like in chapter 1, we'll just keep reading here in chapter 3. Look at verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given, me, given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Well, now we know how Paul got the mystery. It was a direct revelation. Who's the he here? It's the Jesus Christ from verse 1. Jesus Christ gave Paul the revelation of the mystery directly, a direct revelation. Keep that in mind. We're going to run into that again as we go through here. Uh, but here he says, As I wrote uh, and made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, uh, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So now Paul received the mystery through a direct revelation from the risen Lord Jesus Christ. How do we all get it? 
how does everyone after Paul get it? It says here by reading his scriptures and through the revealing work of the Holy Spirit. We read Paul's scriptures, the Holy Spirit works within us, revealing those truths to us, and that's how we learn it today. But notice this was something kept secret. Uh, Go down to verse 9. Verse 9. Oh, let's, let's go to verse 8. Unto me, whom the less the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, if they're unsearchable, can you search them out anywhere? No, you can't find it. This means even if you go to the Old Testament, the Gospel accounts, the writings of Peter and the Twelve, they're unsearchable. You can't find them there. The closest any of them get to the mystery is Peter at the very end, the last thing he writes at the end of his ministry, he says, if you want to know about what's going on today, you got to go to Paul. He still doesn't say anything. Even then, he says, you got to go to Paul. It's the unsearchable. If it's unsearchable, it can't be searched, right? Now, I know historic Christianity has us all brainwashed, and they say, it's not, you know, it was there in the Old Testament, it just wasn't put together as nicely as it is now, or it was foggy. Well, I got, an, I got proof that's wrong. They say it's hid in the Old Testament. I've got absolute 100% proof that that teaching is wrong. And you know what it is? We're going to read the next verse. Look what the next verse says. Verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, from which the beginning of the world hath been hid in the scriptures. That's what your theological systems, your religious systems say. God's just continuing one long program, man and his redemption. Paul's just picking up where Peter left off. Peter picked up where Christ lived off, left off. Christ picked up after the Old Testament. It's all just one thing. He doesn't mean it's really hid. It's not hid in the scripture. What does God say? You remember, Paul isn't just writing this. God is. It was hid in God. It doesn't say it was hidden in the scriptures. It wasn't a foggy thing in the scriptures, <clears throat> and now it's something that's clearly seen. Uh, it was something unknown, unsearchable. That's this mystery. Go over to chapter 5, verse 32. Chapter 5, verse 32. This is, he, after, uh, and again, I'm not developing these passages now. I'm just bringing out some things. He's talking about the marriage relationship, and he brings out, draws an analogy then to verse 32. Uh, He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, his body, the the body of Christ. And then one last one we'll just look at now, because this will really uh, lead us into what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. That's in chapter 6, verse 19. Chapter 6, verse 19, and for me, that utterance, now he's talking about the purpose of the armor of God. Here's the purpose, why God gives us armor. Uh, It's not to do all that spooky stuff that they say out in the religious world. Uh, Here he tells you why he's given us the armor of God. Verse 19, and this is true of Paul, it's true for us. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. That's the purpose of the armor of God. If you're successfully putting on the armor of God, you're boldly proclaiming the mystery. Let's keep reading. To make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, I find that phrase very, very interesting. If I say uh, a a wave of crime, what is the prepositional phrase there, of crime? It explains what the wave is, right? What would you automatically think when you hear the word wave? You're thinking of a wave of water, right? Uh, That would be the typical wave. This isn't a wave of water. Uh, When you say wave of crime, it's a wave made up of crime, not water, uh, made up of crime. Uh, And I think this is very interesting because here you have him saying at the end of Ephesians that talking about this mystery that consists of the gospel. What did he say? What did we just learn last week at the end of Romans? He said he flipped them. It's the gospel made up of the mystery. You have both 
uh, extremes there. That that's one package. You can't separate them. Uh, it's one ingredient. It's a mystery. Is what consisted of the. It consists of the gospel, and the gospel consists of the mystery. They're one thing, inseparable, uh, and that's going to lead to what we're going to talk about today, because. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised with all the response I got from last week. One group of those responses had a lot to do with this people who never thought uh, at the gospel and the mystery together. People from Grace Churches. So I'm glad I brought it up. No one has to agree with me, but at least try to understand what I'm saying, uh, that you can't separate the gospel and the mystery. They're the same. The mystery consists of the gospel, here in Ephesians, uh, the, go uh, the gospel consists of the mystery at the end of Romans. They're the same thing. Uh, and a lot of people said, I always thought, you know, the gospel was this thing that got you saved. You know, the really important thing is the gospel. And then this other body of truth, this thing called the mystery, that's nice. It's frosting on the cake, you know. If people don't get it, that's okay. Uh, it's not really all that important. Uh, and a lot of people say they have, now I'm exaggerating a little to make a point, uh, they probably wouldn't put in those exaggerated terms, uh, but you get the idea. There's two different bodies of truth, and you know, the important thing is that people get the gospel. Uh, the mystery, you know, that's a secondary thing, not all that important. And that's what I wanna push back a little on, that's what I wanna fight a little against, uh, because I don't think that's the case. I think they go together, they're one and the same thing, they're one package. Uh, of the people who mentioned a, a scripture, and this is where we're gonna go today, several people mentioned a scripture, and the script, they all use the same scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, three and four. So what I wanna do today to set us up, if, you're, if, uh, if we leave, I guess that's my first point, so maybe I'll put it up here. If we leave Romans uh, and not see the mystery in everything Paul says and does, we haven't really learned Romans. That's my proposition. We haven't really learned Romans. Uh, and one person, gave, several people gave this verse, or these couple verses, uh, and uh, they said, there's no mystery here. This is just the gospel. So what I wanna do for today, since this is such an important thing and several people uh, commented in one way or another on it, I just wanted to go ahead and let's go look at this one of these favorite uh, uh, Bible uh, passages, I guess. Go, go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now we're gonna, not gonna forget what we learned in Romans. We're, we're out of Romans, I'm not officially, but we can't forget in what we learned in Romans. We have to keep going, and we have to bring all that Romans truth into, into 1 Corinthians 15 here. And so let's look at these verses. Uh, and the, usually they're just mentioned these two verses. So let's, look at, let's just read verses 3 and 4. We probably almost all know them by heart. For I delivered unto you, I'm at 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day uh, according to the scriptures. And then this stops there. Now, y you get the idea from the way these two verses are typically used that these are just kind of like, they just kind of dropped in out of the clear blue sky, uh, and they just kind of mean whatever you think they mean. Uh, but they don't drop in out of the clear blue sky. They're in a book called 1 Corinthians, and they're in chapter 15. So I think what we have to at least do, uh, this is what I call memory card uh, thinking. We get a memory card, it says on the back gospel, or it says salvation, or something like that. You flip it over and it's got 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Then you ask someone, I've done this many times, you ask someone, well, do you know what the problem was in that chapter? No. Do you know the, verses, the two verses before those verses? No. Do you know the verses after that? No. They've just been told what, they, what this means. Uh, and they, we're going to go and we're going to look at the actual context and see why Paul mentions those two things in this passage. And then 
we can all make our own decisions on what they can apply to or not. Uh, and I think one of the key problems we got to keep in mind here, we've talked about this many times in the past, so I'm just going to mention it uh, casually here. We've been trained to think uh, by uh, mostly man-centered theological systems and man-made religious systems. We've been taught to think uh, especially in Reformed, Calvinist, Lutheran uh, teaching, which predominate, uh, that the whole scripture, everything God's doing, centers on man and his redemption. Everything revolves around man and his uh, redemption or salvation. It's going all the way back to Adam, all the way to the end. All the Bible's about is how God's unraveling plan to save man from his sin. That's called a man-centered theological system. Hopefully, after coming through Romans, we see that there's, uh, that's a man-made system. There's another system in the universe uh, that's designed by God. And God says, no, man isn't the center of the universe. I'm the center of the universe. Now, if any of us said we're centers of the universe, that, that we all could just uh, write that off. Uh, but this is God, and he says him and his glory is the center of the universe. He's the center of everything. If we operate according to man-made theological systems, uh, we're going to be stressing man's redemption and salvation. As important as that is, and I don't, don't anyone get me wrong, that is infinitely important, and I thank God for it every second of every day, but I suggest that's looking at the second thing when it should be really, you should be looking at the first thing. If we look at it from God's perspective and we look at it from the perspective of God being the center of everything, God putting on display his glory, you're going to look at it a little, you're going to prioritize a little differently. If you start out from a man-centered viewpoint, you're going to stress the gospel. If you start out from a God-centered standpoint, you're going to stress the mystery. And that's where the division comes in. Uh, but there is no division. They go together. Uh, in God's, from God's viewpoint, if we operate according to the ladder, we focus on the ladder, God as the center of the universe. If God is center of the universe and you're not the center of the universe, what's going to be your first question? It's not going to be, how do I get saved? The first point of the question is going to be, there's the God of the universe. What's he doing? And then you learn what he's doing, and then he says, I've provided a way you can participate in what I'm doing through the personal work of my son on that cross. The mystery and the gospel go together. It's only if you reduce what God's doing today to just a man-centered theological system that you separate them out. Because in a man-centered theological system, all you care about is man and his salvation. You don't care about God. So you throw away the mystery. That's the, the mystery tells you what God's doing today. And you've got to keep those things together. Hopefully uh, that makes some sense. We've been over that many times. God's glory is now being revealed through the revelation of the mystery which manifests the good news of the cross uh, of Christ and the love of God displayed there through his infinite grace uh, it is generated, that is generated by his, the grace is generated by that work on the cross. That's, it's a whole package. It's revealed, the mystery is the, consists of the gospel and the gospel consists of the mystery. One package. Uh, we can't separate them out. Uh, that's what the, the only reason we think you can separate them out is because we've been taught by a historic Christianity that's mostly rejected what God's actually doing today through the Apostle Paul. Second mistake. This is a preparatory for going to 1 Corinthians here and looking at this passage. The second mistake we made, we talked about on this Thursday uh, as well, is the word save. The word save doesn't always mean eternal justification before God, salvation from sin, death, uh, perdi eternal perdition in hell. It doesn't, sa save is just a generic word. And in order to know what you're being saved from, 
or being saved to, you have to get it from the context. Every place you see the word saved in the Bible, it's not eternal salvation or salvation from sin, death, and hell and all that. Uh, it can, Paul talks about be, he's sitting in jail and he's praying that he'll be saved. He's not praying he's going to be saved, justified unto eternal life. He's praying that he'll be saved in the sense of delivered out of jail. And you get that use all the time. So we're not going to fall in the trap. If we see the word save, we're gonna, we need to at least go one step. It may refer to eternal salvation, but we need to at least ask the question, does this refer to eternal salvation, or is this salvation from something else? It's just a generic word that can mean any of that. All right, so let's now, we're gonna, not going to use go the memory card approach to this. Just take out a couple of verses. See, that's, the adva that's why people like memory cards, right? Uh, you know, you go there, you, you have your breakfast, and you pull out a memory card. Of course, now maybe it just pops up on your computer screen or something, and you read this nice verse, and it, it, you like it, because you, you don't usually pick ugly verses to put there. You like it, it sounds good. You make it, make it mean whatever you want it to mean. Uh, and it really doesn't mean anything then, if it just means whatever you want it to mean. The right way to study the Bible is to go study the Bible, study it in context, and then a few key verses that stick out in your mind or to help you remember the, verse, the passage in its context, uh, you can memorize that. That would be the better way of doing it. Uh, the memory card way is just basically our way to get God's word to mean whatever we want it to mean. So we're not going to do that today. We're going to look... Uh, at the actual context here. This verse has a context. This, these two verses didn't just drop out of the sky uh, to tell you with the gospel and eternal salvation. So let's see what, where we go here. And I've made a list. I'm just going to mention these now. We're going to go through each of them. So I'm uh, going to scan over these as we read through here. I'm just kind of preparing the ground. Verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel... Uh, so we have the gospel, Paul's gospel. What does gospel mean? It means good news. Now we're going to have to keep that in mind. Paul's preaching good news about something. And we'll have to look at that. Then he says, which I preached unto you. So we have some preaching. We've had a lot of preaching in 1 Corinthians. Uh, if we were to really do this right, we'd go back to 1 Corinthians 1. Of course, I can't cover 15 chapters of 1 Corinthians in a 45 minutes, so we can't do that, but we can at least go back here to the beginning of Romans, or uh, see, I did it again, 1 Corinthians 15. There's been a lot of preaching, though, uh, his references to preaching in Corinth, uh, in 1 Corinthians. We'll have to take a quick look at that, uh, but not much. Then we're going to read, he go on here, and he says, which also ye have received, now here I want everyone to pay attention to the verb tense. I know you thought when you got out of sixth grade you were done with that, uh, but I'm going to insist on it here. So let's just go through here and see what the tenses are. Which I preached, so Paul preached this gospel in the past, that's past tense, uh, back when he was with them in person. Years have gone by. These are, this is years later, he writes the epistle. Back then, I preached the gospel to you. What did they do with it? Uh, which you also have received. Back there, they received it by faith. And that meant they are wherein they are now standing. They stand. That's a perfect tense. That's something that happened in the past but keeps going on. So Paul preached the gospel, gospel to them. They received it by faith and it put them in a right standing before God that goes on and on and on and on and on. We call it eternal security. That all happened in the past. The ongoing result is they're in a right standing before God forevermore. That's what you get out of verse 1. Now, uh, now we're going to go to ch verse 2. So, uh, and, and we will bring out here, they received it from Paul, uh, of course, if they received it from Paul, Paul received it from someplace else. Look down at verse 3. Ver, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received. So it's going to talk about Paul receiving it. We're going to take a look at that as well. Then we're going to look, uh, look at verse 2, though. This is a real trouble. See, this one, this verse, never makes it on that memory card. 
this is a little bit of a troublesome verse. Uh, by which ye are saved. Now, ye are saved there. Guess what that is? That's a present tense. By which ye are saved. He's saying they need to be saved from something now. But Paul, you just told us in verse 1, we were saved back in years before this when you preached the gospel to us and we received it in faith. And you just told us in verse 1, we now have a, stand, a right standing before God that goes on forever. But now you say in the present, we need to be saved. They needed salvation in the present. So we'll have to look at that. What, what salvation do they need? They need some kind of saving in the present. We'll take a look at that. Uh, otherwise, now look what he says. That's pretty shocking in verse 2. If you keep, now we have a conditional. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. See, that, verse, that one never comes in. They, they always leave that one off when they're quoting chapter, verse 3 and 4. That's kind of a troublesome verse. Does it mean they lost their, their, uh, lost their salvation? Does it mean they were never saved at all? Uh, does it mean con salvation's conditional? If salvation, what does salvation mean? What is he talking about here? See, that's never part of the verse when they quote verses 3 and 4. So we'll have to take a look at that. Then the final thing we'll look at, uh, we're going to tie that into another question I got from a couple people over the last week uh, on a, uh, that idea of according to the scriptures. All right, we've heard this verse quoted a lot. And I've already hopefully pointed out some ways it, uh, it's questionable. We really need to understand uh, what he's talking about here. Uh, I would suggest, since what do I got to lose? Uh, this is kind of this, this kind of memory card approach to the gospel, I think it is our way of getting out of things easy. It's kind of like, oh, here we have this nice little ball, soft ball called the gospel, and we love it over the sinner's plate, and we just kind of hope and pray uh, he hits it out of the park. It's kind of, then we go back and watch TV or sports. We did our job. Uh, how different this is from what we learned in Romans 15. Romans 15, now there it was weak believers and strong believers. I understand that, but I think it would be the same application to strong believers and the unsaved. He told them, no, bring them under your arm in love and teach them about what God's doing today in his mystery program and how they can participate in that through the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, I think this is kind of the easy way. Eh, we, we quoted these two verses to him. We did our part. We gave him the gospel. Uh, and that's all expected of us. We're, we chalk us up in heaven and we're doing good. I think it's kind of an easy way out. Uh, and uh, the problem with this is that when we look at the context for verses 3 and 4 here, Paul is not uh, t talking to the Corinthians about their justification before God unto eternal life. They were saved years before in that sense. It, we won't go there, but... 1 Corinthians, the first eight verses talk about how they're saints, they're set apart by God, they're confirmed to the end, they're all that. Uh, it's not calling into question that. They were saved years before from that. The problem, so we have to decide what are they being saved from? That's a, the key thing here. Uh, that's going to be the problem. The problem he's addressing here, so let's identify that before we go any further. What is the problem they need to be saved from? It's not the sin and death and hell. That's already happened when Paul was there in person. What they need to be saved from. Look over at, flip over a page, if you have to, to chapter 15, verse 12. Here's the problem in Corinth. This is why he's quoting those two aspects of uh, the gospel. Verse 12. Now if Christ preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection from the dead? So that's the problem. There's false teachers coming into Corinth, and it's not clear here uh, whether Paul thought they actually, some at least in Corinth, were already following these false teachers, or that the church was at risk of making the mistake of falling, uh, following those teachers. But that's the problem. There's false teachers in Corinth, and they're saying there is no resurrection from the dead. 
Now, when, does that explain why Paul quotes two verses about Christ's death and resurrection? That's why he's using those verses. There's this error that they need to be saved from in Corinth, not their eternal justification before God, saved from sin, death, and hell, and all that. They need to be saved from something right then in the present. These false teachers who are set in a trap. And Paul's afraid those Corinthians are going to fall in that trap. So either he's afraid they need, they need to be saved from falling in the trap, or if they've already fallen in the trap, or some of them have, the only way to be saved out of the trap is Pauline Grace Mystery Truth. And that's the purpose of this. That's the problem. That's what they need to be saved from uh, in this particular passage. That's why he's using this terminology of death as focusing on these two aspects of the gospel because they're especially pertinent to the problem in Rome at that time. Now we kind of raise our eyebrows like how could they say there's no resurrection from the dead. Evidently, this was a problem. We're not going to turn there, but if you go over to 2 Timothy 2.18, you see another occasion uh, where two men, Paul's coming really hard down on them and they're teaching that the resurrection had already happened. So uh, there's, been, there's, some, there's something in the Greco-Roman world here that's making it a little difficult for them to grasp this resurrection concept, and I'd just suggest uh, it was unique to Christianity. They didn't have anything like it before. They either thought they just died and left, and that was the end of them, or some do, the, the, you know, we're kind of the, not, what's that other one, not resurrection, uh, when you become like an animal or something, what's? Reincarnation, reincarnation thank you. <laughs> reincarnation, those kind of ideas. But the Greco-Roman world didn't have an idea for this resurrection, and I don't, Probably it was hard for some of them to get, especially if they were not believers outside the church. And they're coming in and they're giving this false knowledge. Either the resurrection didn't uh, happen, there is no resurrection, or the resurrection already occurred. It's a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. Or they're getting it all confused. So I think there's some uh, reasons why that's the case. Uh, the salvation here is not a reference to their eternal justification before God. That's not in question. I think we have to look at this just to drive this home. Go, just flip, keep your finger in 15, but go to chapter 1. You, we have to see that these people are already justified unto eternal life. Uh, verse 2, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, they're set apart in Christ Jesus, called saints, so God identifies them as his saints, his own, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Look down at verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end. These, that's exactly what Paul said in verse 1 in chapter 15. He said, when I was there in the past, years before, I preached the gospel to you. You received it in faith. Now you have a standing before God that goes on forever. And he's just saying that. Who shall confirm you to the end? That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. Doesn't rely on their faithfulness. It relies on God's faithfulness. So they're already eternally justified unto eternal life. They already have that salvation, but now they need in the present. Now years have gone by, and there's false teaching coming into Corinth, and they're set in traps. And maybe some in Corinth have already fallen in the trap, and they're being taught, uh, being told that there is no resurrection. And Paul's going to go through that and all its uh, ramifications as you go there. Let's look at some of the ramifications. Go back to 15, verse 16. 15 verse 16, for if the dead rise not, then is not, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are, uh, ye are yet in your sins. Then they, uh, then they which are fallen asleep or perish, and he goes through all these uh, ramifications. If what the false teachers are saying 
then it nullifies all that Paul's taught them. And they need to realize that. They need to realize it. All right, so let's start going through the list we have in the other slide. Let's look at each thing in that list, in this passage. Now let's take a look. Let's go back. The first one, remember, was good news. So you have to ask this question. Here we have, he's talking about the death, of res death and resurrection of Christ, uh, and we have to ask the question. Now, if you don't know anything about your Bible, then you're not going to get the answer right on this. It's just that simple. If you listen to man-made theology, you're not going to get the answer right on this question either. When did the death and resurrection of Christ, let's just focus on the death of Christ for now, when did that become good news? That's an important question. Was it good news in the Old Testament? Well, I defy anyone to read Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53 and find anything good in there. Was it good news when Peter, when Jesus said, I, Peter, I got to go to Jerusalem, uh, suffer and, and die and rise again on the third day? Uh, what did Peter do? He'd say, oh, that is great, Lord. That's just what the scriptures have been talking about. Let's go. No, what did he do? He defied him. You not on my watch. No way, no how. What about Peter after the death and resurrection? Certainly Peter taught it as good news. Well, we're not going to go there because we don't have the time, but if you, we've been there before, chapters 2 and 3 of Acts. Uh, the last thing you'd describe, what Peter's describing there, of the death of Christ is good news. He presents it to Israel as bad news, horrible news. Look what you've done. You killed your Messiah and your king. What? And, get, and guess what, guys? I hate to break it to you, but the guy you thought you got rid of, he rose, God raised him from the dead, and he's coming back to get you. Repent. It wasn't good news then. It didn't become good news until our Apostle Paul. Came good news through our Apostle Paul. It wasn't any place else. Therefore, Paul's new gospel is something not separate. If, here's the thing with the mystery. The mystery is it wasn't made known before. Would that fit the bill of not being made known before? The good news. Now, the death of Christ, you could argue, was made known before. But the death of Christ is good news for the whole world, Jew and Gentile alike, uh, ungodly sinners on enemy status before God, that was never revealed before. It's the mystery. The gospel is the mystery. The mystery is the gospel. The mystery consists of the gospel. The gospel consists of the mystery. The very act that's good news means that God began a new program and re revealed a new program, that mystery program. All right, preaching. He says he preached the gospel. Now we say, well, you know, uh, is he preaching the gospel, not the mystery? Well, go back to chapter 1 again. Chapter 1 again. Uh, and let's see, what, what was he preaching? When he was preaching the gospel, what was he preaching? He's going to list it all out here. All the different words, all the different phrases, I guess it would be, for his preaching. Look at verse 17, 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That's, it's not the exact word order, but that's what he said in first, uh, first chapter 15, verse 1. So he's preaching the gospel here to the, to Cor in Corinth. Look at verse 18, the very next verse. Uh, the very next verse, for the preaching of the cross. Now we have the preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the cross. Now go down to verse 20, uh, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, uh, but it pleased God uh, by the foolishness of preaching to save them that, that believe. So here we have the wisdom of God. All within a handful of verses, the preaching of the gospel is the same as the preaching of the cross, which is the same as the preaching of the wisdom of God. And what do we already discuss and remember from Romans 11? I think it's verse 33. The wisdom of God is the mystery. And he's preaching the mystery. And he comes out and says that. Go to chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. 
to all believers, to the, those who are complete in Christ, we, believe, we preach the wisdom of God. There's the mystery, and now he says it explicitly uh, in a mystery. Here in this handful of verses, couple handful of verses, the preaching of the gospel is the same as the preaching of the cross, which is the same as the preaching of the wisdom of God, which is the same as the preaching of the mystery. So when he says he's preaching the gospel, it doesn't mean it's this separate body of truth. In the very first chapter of uh, Corinthians, he explains that they all interrelate. They're one body of truth. Now, obviously, you can't preach a whole body of truth at once. You might stress one aspect because it's like here, our two verses here. Why does he pick those two things about the gospel? Well, because they're pertinent to the problem in Corinth. They were questioning the resurrection from the dead. So therefore, Paul's preaching of the gospel was not something separate from his preaching of the mystery. It flowed out of his, the mystery program, or his mystery revelation. All right, let's look and go to the next one. Received. Uh, when, what did Paul receive, and when did he, when did he receive it? Uh, so let's look at, let's go back. We're gonna, we already read this in Ephesians 3. Let's just remind ourselves of that. Go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 3, and he says in Ephesians 3, verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. So there you have, uh, God made known to, to Paul the mystery through a direct revelation from the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Now look what he says in Galatians. Go to Galatians 1. Here they're having a big problem with the gospel. They're leaving Paul's gospel and going to Peter, James, and John's gospel. And it's causing all kinds of problems. And look what he says here. Verse 11, Galatians 1, verse 11. But I certify, that means he guarantees, he's, he's driving home the absolute factuality of this. I certify unto you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached, unto, uh, preached of me is not after man. Now let's count them. That's one. That's pretty clear on its own. He probably only needed to say it once but he knows how dull we are. And he knows that we're gonna have a tendency to have a man-centered theology instead of a God-centered theology. So you know what he does? Read it on, verse 12. For I ne neither received it of man. He says it a second time. Do you think it's pretty important if he says it twice right next to each other? Like, don't miss it. If you miss the first time, don't miss the second time. I didn't get this from man. Now, your theological system, our theological systems, our religion, they say Paul got it from man. He went to Peter. Peter told him what's going on. Now he's carrying on Peter's work. God and Paul say, no, I received it through a direct revelation from God. Uh, well, let's keep reading. And it was not of men. Neither was I taught it. So there's a third thing. He wasn't, didn't receive it of men. Uh, it was not of men. He didn't receive it from men. And he wasn't taught to him by men. But by a revelation, a direct revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how he received the gospel. But in Ephesians, he says that's the way he received the revelation. He's received them both the same way. They're the same body of truth, progressively revealed true, uh, but the same uh, body of truth. They go together. Therefore, the gospel uh, and the mystery are not two distinct separate items, but one item that through which all the other items flow. The best way I can say this, I had thought maybe a coin with two sides, but then the more I thought that, no, because the two sides are really different. And that's not really what I'm trying to, so forget, forget I told you the coin with two sides. I didn't like that. I had it in here at first, then I didn't like it, so I erased it. But the only best way I can come up with to describe it is uh, that, put this, is that the preaching of the gospel is done, occurs, flows out of the context of the mystery. The very fact Paul's taking good news to the Gentiles, apart from Israel and through her fall, is the mystery. He can't eat, he couldn't do that unless God had changed the programs. They go together, one, with a, one without the other would fail. And no doubt that's why a lot of Jews persecuted him so strongly, because they denied the God part of this, the mystery part, God's change in programs, and they said Paul was a blasphemer because he's taking out the gospel to the Gentiles. Remember 1 Thessalonians 
2, verse 20 or something around there, he says, they're trying to forbid, forbid me to go to the Gentiles. Now, why were they doing it? Because they were mean? Not necessarily. They were doing that because that's not the way God's program is supposed to work. All the Jews knew at that time was God's program of going, taking his blessings out to the Gentiles was supposed to happen through Israel, restored, regathered, restored, rejuvenated, raised above all other nations. Then they would take it out. That's the prophetic program. The very fact you have this old man stumbling through the world, taking out God's blessings apart from Israel, without Israel, and with her fall, that's the mystery and he's taken that gospel out. The good news and the mystery are the same thing. God's good news for today is he started a new program. Instead of coming back in wrath and judgment, destroying us all, he started a new program through the Apostle Paul. The mystery program that's his good news for today. I think they can't be separated. And I think if we have this clearly in mind, it's going to totally revolutionize our understanding of the book of Ephesians. And the more I study Ephesians, the kind of separate and intensely, the more certain of that I am. Uh, so now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. Well, I, I'm still here. I don't know if you are. 1 Corinthians 15. So we, now let's look at this. We looked at receive. Uh, let's look at the saved part now. This is the real bugaboo. This, one, this is another one that gives me a, a little chuckle. I know it, it probably brings out my flesh, fleshly sin nature. But I have tons of commentaries. And I went to my commentaries. Uh, and I'm just looking to see what some of them say. Now, you know what most of them say, especially the more, I went, not, not even so much liberal, but the uh, non-dispensational, non-evangelical type, uh, they come along and say, see, you can lose your salvation. Look what it says. That's what Paul says here, verse 2. By which ye are saved, if, if. Now, sometimes if can have the sense of since, but that doesn't work in this verse. It's if, as a conditional, if, uh, if you keep in memory what I preached among, unto you unless you have believed in vain. See, they say, you can lose your salvation. Now, if you're by more evangelical commentaries, they say, well, of course you can't lose your salvation. These people were never saved to begin with. So there you get the two options. That, and I suggest it doesn't have anything to do with that because the saved here is not justification unto eternal life. As we already saw, it's salvation from falling into the trap of these false teachers. Being saved from thinking that there was no resurrection and how that would nullify uh, the whole Christian faith, basically, in one, uh, in one step. So we're not going to go there. That, does, that doesn't... Uh, fit because we don't even have to go back anywhere else because he just told us in verse 1 that they have this perfect tense standing that they got in the past and has ongoing results that go all the way to the end. So it's not that they're losing their salvation, that eternal justification salvation. It's not that they never were saved, justified before God to begin with. It's that they, as saved people, justified before God and a right standing before God, they now need to be saved again from a wolf that's come onto their terrain, and they need to be saved again. And the way they're going to be saved again is by remembering what Paul taught them. He says here, by remembering the, what I preached unto you, unless you have believed for nothing. If they, now they're saved and justified, if they stop uh, paying attention and remembering what he said, they're going to fall in that trap. But they can be saved from that predicament, the problem in Corinth at that time, by remembering Paul's teaching. Remembering Paul's preaching of Jesus Christ according to the gospel in the context of the mystery would save them from this satanic uh, deception, uh, uh, confusing them over the resurrection issue. Uh, that would, and that would call, Paul brings out the point, we're not going to deal with every aspect of this, uh, but Paul brings out the point that uh, that would call into question everything they did. Now do you know why in verse 3 he's emphasizing that Christ died for our sins? Well, when it gets to, the, to verse 16, he says, if there's no resurrection, then you're still dead in your sins. 
That's why he's bringing up these things. It's not because this is a perfect little statement of everything in the gospel. This is, he's bringing up these things because these, he's addressing a specific problem in Corinth that they're about uh, ready to fall into the trap of this false teaching. And he's trying to save them from that. And that's why he's using these. If not for that, they would still be dead in their sins. Everything would be vanity, vanity. All right, so if they remembered what Paul taught them uh, in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery from which flows the good news of Christ's death uh, for our sins and resurrection for believers. If you continue to remember this and re uh, remain clinging to it, it will save them, us too. That's the answer to us too, right? I mean, we may not have that specific problem, uh, but we got a lot of other problems that we can fall into de Satan's deceptive traps and are our, our, uh, messing us up in our doctrine or messing us up in our thinking. It's the same answer. The problem isn't probably the same for us, uh, but the answer is the same. Remember Paul's teaching, what Paul taught us. Remember a Timothy? I love that verse in 1 Corinthians 4. Timothy's whole purpose, he just goes around where Paul was and reminds him of everything Paul taught everywhere in every assembly. That's what a Timothy does. And I suggest that's what a pastor is a Timothy if he does those things. All right, so uh, he's going to go and uh, we're going to look at now, if you continue, there's a conditional uh, he's obviously not calling into question their eternal salvation. He's said over and over through this epistle they're eternally saved. But he is worried that they're going to fall in this trap. They need to be saved from a specific problem uh, cropping up its head in Corinth at that time. And that's why he's verses 3 and 4 are there. They're addressing a specific issue. It's not that that makes up the whole gospel and everything else is mystery or something. It, it's because he's got a specific problem here he's dealing with. All right, so in conclusion, because we have one more aspect uh, we, I want to look at here, the gospel and the mystery go hand in hand. Uh, I suggest uh, that the, God, the mystery is in this passage, and hopefully I've demonstrated why I believe that anyhow. Uh, the mystery, you can't separate it. Romans ends with the gospel that consists of the mystery, and Ephesians ends with the mystery that consists of the gospel. He's bracketed the whole thing, uh, God's whole program today, uh, on the basis of that. Uh, and Paul here is using these two verses, these two things, uh, that uh, aspects of the gospel, not necessarily because that's the whole gospel, and, you know, everything else is something else, but because that's how he's going to try to uh, address this problem that's cro cropped up in Corinth, that there's no resurrection from the dead. God's body of truth uh, called the mystery is God's good news for today. Certainly, uh, God's good news flows out of the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, but that is not all there is to the gospel. He brings this up here specifically because of the problem at hand uh, that they're falling prey to people teaching that there is no resurrection. All right, so now let's look. This brings to a second uh, question that came up, uh, or comments and questions over the last week from last week's message. And so let's take finish up with that then. And that, this will bring us back uh, to verses 3 and 4 in the according to the scriptures uh, comments. So here we had, I had another question last week from a couple people. Usually if I get one, I don't usually do anything. But if I get two or more, uh, I'll usually go ahead and just kind of review it uh, in the assembly like this because I'm kind of figuring if more, two or more people uh, that probably aren't part of this assembly or associated with it hey, respond in this way. Uh, maybe there's some here who have these same thoughts or questions. All right, one, one of the things he commented on was that in Romans 16, 26, where it talks about in our King James, it has the uh, scriptures of the prophets. Uh, our new King James, it says uh, the prophetic scriptures. He said, and I, I think this is an important thing to keep in mind, he, he said uh, that that can't be Paul's scriptures because the New Testament scriptures weren't uh, identified as scriptures 
till three or 400 years later when those church councils came along. And that's a very common error. Why is that a common error, like so many other common errors? Well, it's because that's what historic Christianity teaches. And so we all think it's true. Uh, these councils had nothing to do whatsoever with identifying the scriptures that what was and wasn't scripture. And I can prove it. I can prove, and I used to think this, because I used to read these history books and everything, and they'd all say, thank goodness for those councils. About 300 years later, they figured out what was scripture, what wasn't scripture, and they compiled them. So I have sympathy for them, because one day someone pointed this out to me, and I was so thankful. Uh, it changed my whole perspective on a lot of things. So I think maybe it's worth mentioning today. So is it true that really they didn't know what were scriptures or not, uh, till these church councils that came later uh, that historic Christianity want you to believe. But go to first, uh, second Peter, second Peter three, second Peter three. So this is Peter. This is the same time frame as Paul, right? Peter and Paul, they're basically the same time. And go to second Peter three, verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. So here's Peter talking, and he's going to talk about, guess who? Paul. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom. Now, <laughs> everyone here, I was hoping I'd see everyone's lips moving with the word mystery. Because when you see the word wisdom in Paul, or used of Paul, it's talking about the mystery program. That's what Peter's talking about here. Why didn't the things that he talked about in Acts uh, with regard to God's prophetic program ever happen? Well, it's because God began a mystery program, the wisdom of God. So right here, every time you see wisdom, boom, mystery. They go hand in hand. They're not even hand in hand. They're, they're, uh, they're representative of each other. Given unto him that which, I, uh, that which hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. So now we have all his epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, wrestle with uh, as they do the other scriptures. Now isn't that interesting? Uh, Peter has no problem identifying Paul's epistles as scripture. When he says other scripture, it must mean Paul's epistles and his mind are scripture. It didn't happen 300 years later. It wasn't wishy-washy until this church council of a mostly apostate church, by the time you get to this point, uh, didn't come and, and decide what and wasn't of scripture. Uh, Peter already knows which, you know, Paul, which of Paul's epistles are scripture. He can identify them. And I'm pretty sure if Peter knows Paul's epistles are scripture, I'm pretty sure Paul knew his, his scriptures were, uh, were, his writings were scriptures. So uh, we have internal proof uh, that, of that. So that, that helped me a lot at one time uh, when I was kind of under this false idea of when the scriptures became scriptures. Uh, and in addition to that, we can just throw in here because it takes us back to Romans, excuse me, I did it again, didn't I? First Corinthians 15, just scan up a couple verses to chapter 14. So go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and we'll close out with this, but go up to verse 37 in chapter 14. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are commandments of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord are the word of the Lord, and with the word of the Lord in writing is what? Scriptures. God gave a specific provision, not this church council 300 years later. He gave a provision during the writing of the scriptures in the time of Peter and the 12 and Paul, and he gave the, a, the spiritual gift of prophets, and one of the spiritual jobs of the prophet was to identify what was scripture and what wasn't. And if they were a true prophet, they would recognize Paul's writings were scripture, were God's commandments, were God's word uh, to them. All right, so uh, now go back to chapter 15. Chapter 15, and we'll close with this. 
Remember the other principle we talked about at the end of Romans 6, uh, yeah, the end of Romans 16? We talked there that principle that Romans sets up in Romans 3.21. Only Paul's scriptures can make known, reveal, uh, fully explain the, what God's doing today in the mystery program. The law and the prophets can only, they can't manifest it, but they can witness to it. It's very important. They can't make it known. We just read in chapter 3, the mystery was kept secret, hidden God, unsearchable in the scriptures. It's not there. You won't find it. Don't bother looking. i give you a heads up. It's not there. Paul's scriptures are the only thing that can manifest, make known, fully reveal what God's doing today. The law and the prophets are off on the sidelines or in the stands cheering him on. They can witness to it. They can witness. It's not contrary to what God was doing in their, in their uh, program. Witness to the nature of God, the nature of sin, the nature of the law, unable to justify anyone, uh, the nature even of justification by faith and grace and the example of Abraham. They can witness, but they can't explain it. They can't reveal it. Only Paul's epistles can manifest and reveal it. They can all, they're just playing a man, uh, witnessing role. So now when we come to verse 3, it says, For I delivered unto you that which I first received, how that Christ died for our sins. Uh, now, uh, if we want to keep this specific, who is the hour? It's the body of Christ. So, uh, if we push this far enough, I'm not going to push it this far, but if you push it far, far enough, what Paul's saying is here is he's talking about his preaching uh, the death of Jesus Christ for our sins uh, as ungodly Gentiles on enemy status before him. He's the only one that taught that. He's the only one that manifested, revealed it. And it says here, but it's according to the scriptures. It's in accord. It's witnessed by the scriptures. Now, I don't think he's being that specific here, to be quite truthful. So that's one way, if you want to really push, push it. Uh, the other way to look at this is that he's saying our sins, and he's including uh, even like Isaiah 53, uh, where it's our sin. He, uh, the suffering servant there dies for the sins of Israel. Uh, and here Paul's preaching, Christ died for the sins of the world. And if you put those together, the Old Testament uh, can, I can witness to that. It can't, he never could have manifested it, but now that it's manifested, they can say, oh, that was in accord with what was revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. Let's look at the next one. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, uh, one commentator I thought had a great point here. I'll read the next one. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Hmm. Why does he use according to the scriptures twice? Why doesn't he just say he died, buried, rose again according to the scriptures? Well, in this commentator, and I think I, I tend to agree with him, he's, he's referring to two different things here. Uh, the scriptures as a whole attest to Christ dying for sins. Of course, in Israel's prophetic program, all that they talked about was him dying for the sins of the nation of Israel, his friends. Uh, and he, Paul talks about him dying for his enemies but you can put those all together and witnesses to that. Why does he say now again when it comes to the resurrection, why does he say again according to the scriptures? Well, I think, uh, and this commentator put this thought in my mind, and I don't, I don't think it's wrong, uh, so I'm just going to throw it out. We can, uh, we can think about it. He's put in the second according to the scriptures. He's talking about another set of scriptures. What are the verses that come after this? He's going to start, little, let's just read verse uh, 5. And then he was seen as Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. And the 12. So I'm going to suggest that the first, according to the scriptures, is the Old Testament. Uh, all, all the scriptures, even Paul's scriptures, attest to the fact uh, that Christ died for sins. One way or another, whether it's Israel's national sins or our uh, individual personal sins. Uh, now he switches, and now he talks about the resurrection, and he's going to talk about another body of scripture. That's more specific. I guess not another, but well, maybe a more specific body of scripture. Because do you know uh, that nowhere in the Bible 
People try to find it, and maybe some, maybe they're even right, but uh, f actually no place in the Old Testament does it talk about Christ dying and rise, raising again on the third day. You won't find it. Now, people try to find it. They look for the word third or three or something, and you know, Amos has, you know, after two days, I'll raise it or him or whatever they're talking about on the third day, that kind of thing. Uh, some people think they find it in the Passover, you know, the Passover, the unleavened bread, the first fruits, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. But none of those really say what Paul's saying here, uh, the scriptures attesting to this. But you know where you do find it, pretty close to this, many times, is in the gospel accounts. And I just suggest that the scriptures he's talking, especially since he's now he's going to go and talk about Peter and the 12 and the gospel people that were there during the gospel, uh, his death and resurrection. Uh, I'm still thinking, uh, and I'm going to think about this some more to see if I change my mind. If I do, I'll let you know. But I'm thinking he's now referring here according to the gospel scriptures. Now, we don't think that's possible because we think, see, this is another one like those church councils in three or 400 in AD. We think that uh, we've been taught by historic Christianity who rejects prophetic prophecy, foretelling prophecy. Therefore, Mark couldn't have foretold the prophecies he did because, you know, you can't foretell the future. So that's where we get most of our, uh, and then those prophecies, they say were fulfilled in 70 with AD with the destruction of the temple. So if Mark is talking about something that happened at the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and you think Jesus couldn't have been giving or Mark giving foretelling prophecies, well then Mark must have wrote after 70 AD because otherwise he wouldn't know about what happened in 70 AD. That's historic Christianity. But if you become Bible-based Christianity and you accept Christ's ability to foretell the future, and not only the fact that the prophecies he talked about didn't occur in 70 AD, but let's set that aside for now. Uh, now you can realize that this has to refer to that, then those scriptures were a lot earlier than historic Christianity says. The only reason they think it couldn't have been till after 70 AD is because they didn't, don't believe in prophetic or uh, foretelling prophecies. If Mark wrote about the destruction of Jerusalem, well, it must have been after the destruction of Jerusalem, obviously. And that's what they could do. That's what they go with. So like John was written in the 90s and, you know. But if you believe in foretelling uh, prophecy, uh, then the scriptures, Paul, I think here, is referring to the gospel accounts, at least some of them. Mark has several quotes that fit this, died, buried, rose again on the third day. Uh, we read one very similar to this in Mark, uh, Matthew 16, I think it was. So I would suggest uh, that perhaps he's drawing attention to that. And so my point in this is that here Paul is not giving a salvation, justification unto eternal life. He's using these two aspects of the gospel to address a specific problem in Corinth at that time having to do with the denial of the resurrection of Christ, uh, which, a denial of resurrection, which would deny our resurrection and deny Christ's resurrection. And of Christ, he brings up his death for sins because if Christ didn't rise from the dead, we're all still dead in our sins. And that's what chapter's 15 about. And I don't think we should just, now that we have this background, we can take those verses out and maybe use them uh, a little more intelligently. The mystery, my point really in this whole thing, uh, the, go back to the very beginning, we'll close. Uh, this person asked, There's no, the mystery isn't in 1 Corinthians 15. All I wanted to try to show today is that the mystery is in every word of 1 Corinthians 15. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're